if we had gas lines, and if we didn't have in place, which we don't, a, a, an immediate way to ration, and, and, the, and the, the rationing plan that we in haste put together in June of 1979 worked fine. It was odd even rationing by license plate. That won't work anymore. We don't have service station attendants. And I don't believe we've printed up rationing books. And so I think in the, in the two or three week gap, while we tried to figure out a rationing program, the, it's not just the motors top up their tanks, the service stations top up their tanks, the jobbers top up their tanks. And that big sucking system you hear is not Ross Perot's worry about NAFTA. It's we've sucked our gasoline supplies dry. And once the tanks are empty, there's no conceivable way unless we went on a busman's holiday for you know three months and just said no one drives uh, no one's going to disgorge their tank and then within a short period of time there are no cars on the road uh, the shelves are empty the uh, and we're basically going back to living like our great-grandparents did the energy business has is overwhelmed with data uh, it just, I mean, there's, there's, it's probably one of the most data intensive industries on earth. And for years, I've tried to understand where does the data come from uh, and how reliable is it? And let me just start with our reported proven reserves. When you see proven, it has a certain, you know, uh, semblance of like, you know, I've been in the vault, I'm the auditor, there are 10 bars of gold. Uh, 99% of our proven reserve reports have never had an audit. <laughs> in the Middle East, they got in an arms race of trying to, of, of, of trying to argue on setting quotas on who had the most proven reserves. And so Kuwait's reserves went from 30 to 90 billion with a stroke of a pencil. The UAE, 30 to 90 billion. Iraq, same number. Iran, same number. Venezuela did the same thing. Finally, Saudi Arabia, who in 1980 had already boosted their reported proven reserves from 110 to 160, they were the laggard. They said, 160, no, it's 60. And then those numbers, they're reported every year. BP reports them in their data book. The Oil and Gas Journal reports them in their data book. They say it's static for two decades. And, and no one ever basically wondered, gosh, how come they produce all this oil and they always stay the same? And if they were occasionally asked, they said, oh, we have a program. We always basically, you know, drill enough new wells to keep static. And I get curious about the productivity of the Middle East and finally do two and a half years of research on, the, on, on Saudi Arabia's oil field productivity. I wasn't even going to get into the proven reserve thing because I thought it's just too complicated. And then, thank my lucky stars, there was a whistleblower at Shell Oil Company who sent a big document kit to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and out of that came the shale oil proven reserve scandal. And those reserves went from 21 to 13 billion barrels in less than a year on four revisions because they brought in an auditor. And that gave rise to me fun finally beefing up one aspect of Twilight in the Desert that's, that's a trivial aspect compared to the productivity. The proven reserves in the Middle East are overstated by at least a third, maybe 40%. Uh, but the proven reserves all over have been overstated because they're all numbers that were driven by internal people wanting to basically to get their per barrel costs down they just added to the base of proven reserves saying well who knows it'll be 80 years before and I won't be around we don't have any reliable production statistics in the world on all on all the important key producing fields other than the North Sea and Cantorill I mean, the, the, you know, Saudi Arabia, you know, you know, confidently says they have 11.3 million barrels a day of productive capacity, and they confidently say we're producing 8.6 million barrels a day. We were producing 9.6, but then we, we cut back to, so the price wouldn't collapse. But there isn't anyone on earth that has any idea how you'd allocate that production among the six key fields, let alone whether it's right. The world economy is basically based on, you know, has been built on the quicksand. And then to realize that it would have been so easy to clamor and demand data reform. I mean, you know, the, if, we had the, if we had the last five year quarter by quarter production history of the largest 200 producing oil fields in the world, then you could trend them out and you could start to prove with the, with the 
you know, to, with a with a proof probability in the 90-95% range, we're either quite a few years away from peak oil, we're past it. Why people don't want that data, I can't imagine. I really honestly don't get it as to why people are so complacent. And I guess it's because we've done so long with the market so well served that we just cannot conceive that that won't go on forever. Why wouldn't the major oil company leadership, uh, if they really understood this, uh, step up to the plate and say, look, we're, we're not stupid. We're spending billions. I mean, you know, collectively the five major oil companies are spending something like $150 billion this year on their EMP and none of them are growing their production. And yet they all say the world has ample resources. And, and, and I've argued to several of these individual company leaders, you know, if, if I were you, I would publish your field by field production to show the magnitude of your decline so the analysts don't think, right now analysts are starting to think these guys are stupid, that you'd look smart. Well, we couldn't do that. It would scare people. And I think basically there's an, 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 a sort of unthought through sense that if basically, even if that were true, and I honestly believe that the leadership of the industry does not believe it's true. Uh, they think the world has unlimited amounts and they don't, they don't, they're not able to connect their pitiful internal performance with what they believe the world can do. And they keep saying, well, yeah, but if we just had access to the Middle East, oh, we'd be in Clover and say, I shouldn't know more about the Middle East than they do. But I did spend three years going through hundreds of technical reports that led me to the conclusion that the Middle East oil fields are few and far between and very old. So if one of the major oil companies broke ranks and said, we're peaking, oil prices are going to go way up, they would actually then not be blamed. But right now those guys are setting themselves up in the target of vicious criticism. The Senate had a hearing and had, all, had, had four of our CEOs of big oil. And I watched every single one of them promise the senators, you gotta realize oil is a commodity, it goes up and it comes down. This is just a temporary sort of you know, tightness because we had some refineries that had to shut down and hedge funds are setting the price up. And Don't worry, we'll be very shortly, we'll be back to $30 oil. And I thought, why would you say that? They don't have any idea why prices are up and there's nothing my opinion, that was going to lead to prices coming down. The CEO of Exxon and the CEO of Shell, both at this program in Calgary, said $70 oil is totally, it's a spike, it's totally unsustainable, uh, you know, the, the economy won't, it won't tolerate it, and by the time the end of the week, oil prices were at 80. 